Well, good evening, and thank you for joining us this evening for the grand finale of the Richard Norton Smith Lecture Series. And by every measure, it has been a wonderful success. And I've heard the most uh, enthusiastic compliments about the lectures that Richard has given in Allendale and then at the Gerald R. Ford last Sunday. And uh, it's really been a hit. It's, it, and many of you, I see, I see many of the same faces that were in some of the lectures. And so you know, uh, it goes without saying, what a hit it was. So thank you, Richard, for abiding by your own motto, which is, history should never be boring. <laughs> now, before formally introducing our, our distinguished speaker, I'd like to point out this is the first time that the three directors of the Hauenstein Center have been in the same place. Richard was the founding director of the Hauenstein Center back in 2001, and when he moved on, Pat Olt, and where is Pat? Do I? Pat Olt over there was the next director and had the helm, and then I came aboard in 2003. But I have to say thank you to the two of you for laying such a great foundation at this university, such a great partnership with the Ford, so that it would be a, a success. So thank you very much. I also would like to recognize several people for making the Richard Norton Smith Lecture Series possible. First and foremost, Ralph Howenstein, who is back uh, there. Yes, there's Ralph and Grace. <laughs> you know, he's an extraordinary individual, and his life of service and generosity has really been an inspiration to us uh, in this community and at the Howenstein Center. Also, I'd like to point out my esteemed colleague, Elaine Didier, whose energetic leadership at the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum is breathing new life into a great institution. Elaine, where are you? There's Elaine back there. And she's really helping make this partnership between the Ford and the Hauenstein Center fly. It's really a model in the nation. And then uh, thirdly, I'd like to point out Marty Allen. Marty, where are you? Uh, by Ralph, thank you. <laughs> Marty's the Chairman Emeritus of the Gerald R. Ford Foundation. He's a great colleague and friend, and I like to see him as the steward, really, of the partnership that we have between the Hauenstein Center and the Ford. Now, a few words about tonight's speaker. Before Richard came back to Grand Rapids this week, I had three questions about him that I personally wanted to answer. First, how was it, anyway, that he became the most knowledgeable person in America about U.S. presidents? Surely it was more than the fact that he'd been the director of more presidential libraries than anybody else on the planet, having served as the head of the Lincoln, Hoover, Eisenhower, Ford, and Reagan. Surely it was more than the fact that he had written six expertly researched and engagingly written books about presidents, George Washington, chief among them, Surely it was more than the fact that he has a much sought out, he's a much uh, sought after commentator on the presidency and U.S. politics on the News Hour with Jim Lehrer and C-SPAN. He's got a great gig with Brian Lamb that many of you have probably seen on other cable channels and on NPR. Well, you want to know the real answer? Richard became the most knowledgeable person in America about the U.S. presidency because he got an earlier start than all of the rest of us. He tells me he was a confirmed presidential junkie by the age of seven. <laughs> Growing up, he and his siblings would fight over the TV in the morning, and they, of course, would want to watch cartoons, and he wanted to watch the Today Show at age seven. And they compromised, and he got to watch current events every other morning. Okay, so Richard knows more about the presidency than anybody else alive. My second question was, how has he attracted such a following? Now, surely it's more than the charm of his Yankee, Arliss accent, or the school from which he graduated, which he proudly calls Harvard. <laughs> Actually, this question's easy to answer if you've spent any time around him. Richard is a born teacher. He's one of the greatest storytellers of our day. And he tells his stories about the presence with such verve and such passion and such enthusiasm that it's contagious, utterly contagious. In fact, watching yesterday's talk about Theodore Roosevelt, I concluded that Richard himself is the TR of presidential historians because he is so ebullient and opinionated. And besides, he is as funny as all get out. You'll see what I mean in this evening's talk when he talks about uh, the eternal optimism of Franklin Roosevelt and Ronald Reagan. 
Now my third question, on a personal note, very briefly, is how could I follow Richard as director of the Hauenstein Center for Presidential Studies? Well, this is the easiest question of all to answer, and there's a good little story from America's founding to illustrate. Go back to the days when the young republic sent Thomas Jefferson over to France to serve as one of the nation's first ambassadors. When Jefferson was presented to the French court soon after his arrival, legend has it that Vergen, the French foreign minister, asked him if he intended to serve as Benjamin Franklin's replacement, to which Jefferson smartly replied, no one can replace Franklin, sir. I am only his successor. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the irreplaceable Richard Norton Smith. Thank you, Gleaves. You delivered that just as I wrote it. <laughs> Actually, I remember, I will quote Ronald Reagan, not for the last time this evening, who once said, I knew Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson was a friend of mine, and you're no Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> but then I'm no Ben Franklin, so we're even. Anyway, thank you for all of the hospitality for everything uh, this week. It's been a memorable week for me. It, it really has felt so much like coming home. And I, I'm, not, I'm not just saying that. Uh, uh, it's actually been an emotional experience for me and uh, not least of all seeing so many old friends and uh, uh, meeting some new ones um, in this magical place because that's how I think of Grand Rapids, um, beginning with the Ford connection but, but going so much further than that. I wanna ask, one thing, please, because you, you saw Ralph, but there are a whole bunch of Hohensteins here tonight. Would all of the Hohensteins please stand up? Everyone named Hohenstein. <laughs> this, of course, is, is part of Ralph's legacy, but, uh, and he should be very proud of this, but that is the real. Hohenstein legacy and how proud you must be, Ralph. So uh, this evening, this one's for you. I um, happened to come across uh, something that Peggy Noonan wrote not long ago, just before the election, um, I, long after we had settled on this topic for this evening. And uh, it was interesting, I, I, maybe some of you might have seen it in the Wall Street Journal uh, opinion page. It was called The Politics of Dancing. And the subtitle was FDR and Reagan had more fun than their successors do, uh, to which I can only say amen. This is how Peggy Noonan addressed the subject of this evening's conversation. And I do hope it'll be a conversation. I hope when I'm done, we'll have an opportunity to, uh, to take some questions. Everyone is focusing on the polls and spreadsheets, on the scandals and negative ads. This, in fact, may be the year negative advertising reached critical mass. Voters are no longer running from the room saying, Smith is dishonest, I must vote for Jones. They're slouched in front of the TV thinking, they're all bums. I'll try to pick the least bummy. We're asking, honey, which bum is least likely to raise my property taxes? The irony of the ads, their relentless tearing down, may force voters to decide based on actual issues. But this, writes Peggy Noonan, is about something else. This is about the dance. The dance is where you see the joy of the joust. It's a gifted pro making his moves. It's a moment of humor, wit, or merriness on the trail. It's the clever jab or the unexpected line that flips an argument. It's a thing in itself, and it's so much itself, so distinctive, that whether you are left, right, or center, red team, or blue, you can look at the moves of a guy on the other side and say with honest admiration, man, that was good. FDR, of course, could dance. Think of him on the stump chanting the names of his congressional foes, rolling their names in his marbly tones, Martin, Barton, and Fish. Or announcing gravely that he's not offended by charges he used government transport to ferry his pets, but his little dog, Thala, is very upset. <laughs> 